Hey guys, uh, so today we are going to be in your interactive notebook. We are going to start on page 15. Uh, before we get that, just want to remind you that your standard six vocabulary is due tomorrow. Uh, that is page six, pages six through eight or slide six through eight in your unit two interactive notebook. So I need to make sure that you have gotten that completed. I have done something differently in terms of you submitting your vocabulary this time. So what I did is on Google Classroom under the standard six vocabulary assignment, uh, I have created a Google slide for you, for each one of you. Uh, so when you go to submit your standard six vocabulary, all you have to do is copy slides six, seven, and eight, and then go to that assignment. And on that Google slide that I have given you, you will just paste those three slides on there. It'll automatically format it for you to where it's not all squished up. Uh, and then you'll submit that. Uh, so trying to make it easier for you in terms of not having to screenshot, not having to adjust anything. All you have to do is when you submit your standard six vocabulary, copy slides six, seven, and eight of your interactive notebook. That's the vocabulary. Go to the standard six vocabulary assignment in Google Classroom and paste those three slides onto the Google slide that I have given you. If you need help or need some clarification for how to do that, reach out to me so I can help you and I can walk you through that. So today on slide 15 of our interactive notebook, we are going to talk about Thomas Jefferson uh, briefly, then we're going to move on to James Madison, where I have an assignment that you are going to do on your own, uh, and I'll explain that here in a minute. So, But first, starting with Thomas Jefferson on slide 15, a uh, period of time in United States history before the Civil War is going to become known as the antebellum area. This is the period from 1800 to 1860. Today, as you can see, as you can see on this timeline, all the stuff that happens. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Jefferson, 1800 to 1804. Those are his two presidencies, and we will talk about James Madison and the War of 1812. Uh, so, looking at um, the election of 1800, president and the vice president will begin running together because of issues with differing political parties. During this time, the two major political parties are going to be the Federalist and the Democratic Republicans. If you'll remember, John Adams, our second president, was a Federalist. He is going to run for re-election in 1800, and he is going to run against Democratic Republicans Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr. Uh, Jefferson and his running mate Aaron Burr will end up beating John Adams, but the problem is that Thomas Jefferson will be tied with his running mate Aaron Burr. Uh, because a vote for Thomas Jefferson during the election of 1800 meant a vote for Aaron Burr as well, which ends up making it to where Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr are both tied with 70, 73 electoral votes. Um, so each man had 73 electoral college votes because presidential candidates and VP candidates were listed on the same ballot. So everyone who voted for Jefferson voted for Burr too. Uh, this, this tie, 73 electoral college vote tie, will throw the election to the House of Representatives, which was a procedure outlined in the Constitution in the case of an electoral college tie. Uh, the House of Representatives will be, at the time of the election of 1800, will be controlled by the Federalist Party. Uh, and although both choices were Democratic Republicans, Alexander Hamilton, who is a leader of the Federalist Party, will prefer Thomas Jefferson over Aaron Burr. Hamilton believed Jefferson to have more character than Burr and would be more suitable for the office of the president. The Federalist legislatures and the House of Representatives will follow Hamilton's lead and vote for Jefferson instead of Burr. So again, Hamilton, being the leader of the Federalist Party and the House of Representatives, will break the tie, the 73 Electoral College vote tie. Jefferson will be named president. Aaron Burr will be named vice president. Uh, and this is going to become a problem because when this tie was noted, Aaron Burr is actually going to go out and campaign against his running mate, Thomas Jefferson, uh, trying to convince people that he was the better presidential candidate uh, and that they should pick him. Uh, Jefferson's going to know about this and so that when Jefferson ultimately wins the presidency, he's never going to forget it. He's going to hold it against Aaron Burr during the first term in office. Their relationship is going to be very hostile, very tense. Uh, there and and Jefferson kind of shuts out and freezes out Aaron Burr, doesn't give him any input into you know matters of the country, uh, and Aaron Burr only serves one term as Jefferson's vice president. He's a he's replaced in the next in Jefferson's next term, uh, and it also doesn't help that Aaron Burr is convicted of murder uh, when he kills Alexander Hamilton in their famous duel. 
So let's answer this question right here to the, to the right of the screen. Why are people upset with John Adams? So again, John Adams is our second president elected in 1796. He runs for re-election in 1800 and loses. He lost because people were upset with him. People are going to be so upset with John Adams because of his crappy foreign policy. So he had a bad foreign policy, but he also had passed the Alien and Sedition Acts, which people thought violated their First Amendment rights, their freedom of speech, their freedom of press. And so people are unhappy with him because he with John Adams because they felt like he violated their their rights and liberties as individuals. And so they're going to make sure that he doesn't get reelected. Uh, Aaron Burr will refuse to draw, withdraw his name from the presidential race once the mistake was noted. How do you think this will affect the relationship between Burr and Jefferson? Again, going to be a very tense, very hostile relationship, especially because Burr was campaigning against Jefferson uh, to be president. So when Jefferson wins the presidency, Burr loses and becomes vice president. Jefferson's going to hold that over Aaron Burr. For the, rem for the remainder of their time together as president and vice president. Thomas Jefferson, in an effort to make sure that this doesn't happen again, will pass the 12th Amendment, which places the president and vice presidents on the same ticket, and then people would vote for a ticket, uh, not just one person. So kind of like today with the elect 2020 election, uh, when people went to go vote, they voted for a ticket. So if they voted for a Republican ticket, they would vote for Donald Trump and Mike Pence, uh, for president and vice president. If they voted on a Democratic ticket, they would have voted for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for president and vice president. They weren't voting for one person. They were voting for a ticket. This is what the 12th Amendment did. So when Jefferson runs for re-election in 1805, people vote for a ticket. They don't necessarily vote for Thomas Jefferson. They vote for the ticket that Thomas Jefferson is, own, is on so that we can avoid a 70, uh, another electoral college tie uh, and, and go through this whole process of the election of 1800 again. Uh, so this next clip, it, this clip I'm about to show you is from the musical Alexander Hamilton, uh, Hamilton talking about the election of 1800. Then we have another clip that shows you uh, and talks about the du duel between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. Can we get back to politics? Yeah, please. Yo, every action has an equal opposite reaction. John Adams shat the bed. I love the guy, but he's in traction. Poor Alexander Hamilton, he is missing in action. So now I'm facing Aaron Burr with his own faction. He's very attractive in the North. New Yorkers like his chances. He's not very forthcoming on any particular stance. Ask him a question that glances off, he obfuscates, he dances. And they say I'm a Francophile. At least they know I know where France is. Thomas, that's the problem. See, they see Burr as a less extreme. Uh -huh. You need to change course. A key endorsement might redeem. Who did you have in mind? Don't laugh. Who is it? You used to work on the same staff. Uh, it might be nice. It might be nice to get Hamilton on your side. It might be nice. It might be nice to get Hamilton on your side. Talk next. Smile more. Don't let them know what color it is. Go to the store for more. hang with him. Charm her. I learned that from you. you, had to, you had 
So Aaron Burr's not going to forgive Alexander Hamilton for endorse, endorsing Thomas Jefferson over him. Uh, and then later on, when Aaron Burr runs for governor of New York, Hamilton seemingly gets in the way and prevents Aaron Burr from winning the governorship. Uh, and that's when Aaron Burr challenges Hamilton to a duel and ultimately shoots and kills him. So this next clip is going to talk about that. July 11th, 1804, Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr row across the Hudson River to a secluded dueling ground in Weehawken, New Jersey. Hamilton and Burr see a lot of each other. New York is not a very big place. They're both lawyers. Uh, sometimes they argue cases against each other in court. They were just a year apart in age. They were both brilliantly educated. They were extraordinarily articulate. Their characters and temperaments have been forged in the American Revolution. And that's where the similarities end. Whereas Hamilton has relied on his ambition and tenacity to cut a path from illegitimate orphan to the new world's elite, Burr was born into wealth and society. It's a distinction that seems to cause an instant and bitter rift between the men. It's clear that Hamilton, on some fundamental level, distrusted Burr. He really felt that it was his job to keep Burr away from power. In 1804, Burr's running for governor of New York, and Hamilton does what Hamilton does, which is he steps up and basically tries to oppose Burr's bid for office. Burr loses his bid for governor and points a finger directly at Hamilton. Ultimately, Burr decides he's had it, and from that point on, now they're actually negotiating a duel. The bitter adversaries take assigned positions and face each other. Hamilton gambled on the fact that Burr would not shoot to kill. Hamilton knew that if Burr did shoot to kill, that Burr would be branded as murderer and it would ruin his career. Ready! Present! There are two shots. It's not absolutely clear what happened. Whatever Hamilton did or didn't do, Burr ended up hitting Hamilton. Uh, hit him in the abdomen, pierced his liver, and lodged in his spine. In critical condition, Hamilton is brought home and dies the next day, surrounded by his family. In the aftermath, Aaron Burr is charged with murder in both New York and New Jersey, but eventually the charges against him lapse. Duels were illegal in every state of the Union, but they were never prosecuted. 
because no jury would convict. Dueling was something that gentlemen did. It was a system outside the law and against the law, but it was something that everybody accepted. Still, Burr never escapes his reputation as the man who killed Hamilton. Getting elected president. All right, so let's look at some basics of the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson will uh, be elected, become third president, beating the incumbent, John Adams. Uh, he is going to, Thomas Jefferson is going to seek to limit the power of the federal government. Being a member of the Democratic Republican Party, he, belay, he believed that states should have more power than the federal government. So this makes sense. Uh, during his time as president, the U.S. will expand further west. Jefferson believed that the United States could only survive if the people owned the land. And so he's going to support the idea of Western expansion and an economy based on agriculture. Uh, so looking at this question up here, how do Jefferson's view on expansion represent his ideas as a Democratic Republican? Here's our answer right here. U.S. could only survive if survive if the people owned land. And Jefferson supports the idea of Western expansion and an economy based on agriculture. So you're going to write these two things up here in this box. So let's think back to the two political parties looking at the Federalist and the Democratic Republicans. The Federalist leader is going to be Alexander Hamilton. He is going to be the face of the party. They're going to believe in a strong Federalist are going to believe and advocate for a strong central government and an economy based on business. And they're going to have a loose interpretation of the Constitution, meaning that Federalists believe that yes, the Constitution gave the federal government and president specific powers but also that there were some things that weren't listed in the Constitution that the federal, federal government couldn't do, and they called those things implied powers. They're not actually in the Constitution, but they are implied that the federal government has the power. So that's the Federalist interpretation of the Constitution, a loose interpretation. Democratic Republican Party, on the other hand, is formed in direct opposition to the Federalist Party. Uh, their leader is going to be Thomas Jefferson, this guy right here. They're going to believe in a strong state government. They feel like Democratic Republicans feel like the federal government should be weak. States should be strong. They're going to be have uh, they're going to advocate for an economy that is largely agricultural, uh, being that the Democratic Republicans are largely situated in the South. They're going to uh, promote agriculture and farming. Uh, and so while the Federalists had a loose, loose interpretation of the Constitution, Democratic Republicans will have a strict interpretation of the Constitution. Democratic Republicans, Thomas Jefferson, believe that uh, if the Constitution didn't say it, then the federal government shouldn't be allowed to do it. And we're going to see here in a minute how Thomas Jefferson kind of goes against that idea when he purchases the Louisiana Territory. Uh, so make sure you've answered this question up here and then you get this stuff filled in right here. OK, so let's look at Louisiana Purchase and the expansion of presidential power. So how did we get to this point? Uh, 1800, France will acquire Louisiana Territory from Spain, which then gives them, gives France control of the lower Mississippi River, including New Orleans right here. Uh, the port of New Orleans is going to be a very vital port that is used by Americans on the Mississippi River for trade and transportation. Uh, and so that, that New Orleans and the Mississippi River is so important that Thomas Jefferson is going to send American diplomats to France to inquire about purchasing New Orleans. He's going to tell his American diplomats to go to the French offer $10 million for New Orleans. That's how important it is to us. Um, but what's also happening in France while these negotiations for New Orleans is going on is that Napoleon Bonaparte, France's new leader, is, is planning to conquer Europe, but lacks the funds. You need money to conquer Europe. And so what Napoleon does is that he goes to his French ministers, his French diplomats, and he tells them, go to the Americans and tell the Americans that if they add $5 million extra dollars, to their offer, not only will I give them New Orleans, but I'll give them the entire Louisiana Territory and the United States. So for $15 million, uh, the Americans would get the entire Louisiana Territory. That's roughly three cents per acre uh, when, it, when it's all said and done. American diplomats can't believe what they're being told. They're, this is a steal. They negotiate the purchase, take it back to Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson signs off on the purchase of the Louisiana Territory. Uh, and so how this was an expansion of the power of the president is that no one in the Constitution does it give the president the power to purchase land from other countries. And so when Thomas Jefferson signs off on the purchase of Louisiana Territory, he's taking a loose interpretation of the Constitution, much like the Federalists do. Uh, so he kind of goes against his ideas of being a strict interpretation 
of the Constitution, doing it for the betterment of the United States. He understands how important land is and the, and the acquisition of land is. And so he's like, look, this is an opportunity to double the size of our country. We can't, you know, we can't miss out on this opportunity. Yeah. So he does it and he shapes it uh, as a good thing for the United States. So now we have all this territory, our, our, the size of our country doubles. So the significance of the United Louisiana Purchase is that the territory doubles in size. Uh, on your notebook and page 15, I left off a text box here. Uh, so if you can insert a text box here so that you can then type in United States doubles in size. So that's the big significance of the Louisiana Territory. Louisiana Purchase is that the United States doubles in size. But now we have all this territory. We need to explore it and figure out what's out there. And that's where we get the Lewis and Clark expedition. So once the Louisiana Purchase was final, Jefferson was worried that as more people moved to these isolated areas, the challenges of communicating and trading with the East Coast could prompt the areas in this Louisiana Territory uh, to secede or leave the United States. Uh, and no one was exactly sure what lay between St. Louis at the Mississippi River and the Pacific Ocean. So Jefferson was going to send Meriwether Lewis uh, and, and w William Clark on a government-funded exploration of Louisiana and Louisiana ter 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 Territory and Western lands all the way to the Pacific Ocean. On their 16-month journey, Lewis and Clark will chart trails west, map rivers and mountain ranges, wrote uh, chart, write descriptions of plants and animals that were strange or unfamiliar to them, and they record facts and figures about Native American tribes throughout the Louisiana Territory. Uh, more significantly, Lewis and Clark will eventually reach, reach the Pacific Ocean and will establish a legal claim to the Oregon Territory along the Columbia River. Uh, Great Britain was also, also had a legal claim to the Oregon Territory at the time, and this is going to be a problem that arises once again uh, when we get to that and get to the 1840s. This claim will allow for future expansion of the United States to the Pacific Ocean and the Lewis and Clark expedition and subsequent claim to the Oregon Territory were not presidential powers listed in the Constitution. So this is, again, another example of expansion of power. There's no nothing in the Constitution that says the president can make legal claims to foreign territory, which is exactly what Thomas Jefferson did. So right here, let's look at the who, what, when, where, and why of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Our who is Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. The what is going to be exploring new territory. This is going to take place in the early 1800s during Jefferson's presidency, roughly 16 months. This wasn't a one to two month journey. This took a little bit over a year to complete. Louisiana territory was a large area to, to explore, so it's going to take them a while. Uh, it's going to take place in the Louisiana Territory. And the why is we needed to know what we could do and could not do in terms of farming, land use, what types of plants and animals were there, and the Native American tribes. Were they friendly? Were they hostile? Could we trade with them? Could relationships be had with them in terms of trading uh, and economic relationships and whatnot? Uh, so pause this video. Make sure you get that typed in for the who, what, when, where, and why. Uh, and then two clips to show you, and then I'm going to explain what I want you to do for James Madison in the War of 1812. In this vast grassland, Lewis discovered new species, including animals that barked, like little toy dogs. They would be named prairie dogs.
Buffalo, Buffalo Hunters. Lewis and Clark were under orders to be friendly with native tribes. Children, we have been sent. Lewis also let them know, in full military dress, that the United States now claimed their land. There were only medals and small gifts for now. But in the future, Lewis told them, other Americans would arrive with the wealth of trade goods. And to inform you that a great council was lately held between this great chief and your own father. Okay, so here are some challenges that they faced. Sagagawea quickly grew more important to the expedition. She showed them edible <clears throat> plants and roots, white apples, wild artichokes, and licorice. When a boat overturned in a strong wind, it was Sagagawea who saved their most important items. Off the river, they faced other challenges. All right, so here's the map uh, just to show you the route of Lewis and Clark. Start here on the St. Louis on the Mississippi River. They're going to follow Lewis and Clark and their party are going to follow the Missouri River up here to the present day United States Canada border and then go west across um, to where they make it to eventually Fort Clatsop in Oregon Territory. And then they'll make their way back. They, Lewis and Clark will actually split up. Lewis will come this way and Clark will come this way where they will meet back here. Um, so what I want you to do now uh, on slides 16 and 17 of your interactive notebook is you're going to complete these two, th these readings. Uh, and so what you're going to do is you're going to uh, read these paragraphs. So you have one, two, three, four paragraphs or four sections that I want you to complete. There's 15 total questions. And so what you're going to do is you're going to read each excerpt and then you're going to answer the questions that go with them. So these questions go with this excerpt, four, five, six, and seven go with the War of 1812, eight, nine, 10, and 11 go with notable battles of the War of 1812, and then 12 through 15 uh, go with this excerpt for the effects of War of 1812. You are not turning these in, you're just going to complete these, uh, make sure you type them in uh, and, and answer, answer them. So I will give you these, this, this first question because it's not in here, but three precedents that Washington left back for future presidents. Number one, stay out of foreign policy. So if you'll remember Washington in his farewell address, uh, warns against, uh, getting entangled in foreign alliances. And so this is going to be something that future presidents really, you know, adhere to in terms of staying out of foreign alliances. When we talk about James Monroe, we'll talk about his Monroe doctrine which really kind of sets this in stone with this being with staying out of foreign alliances number two establishing cabinet systems a group of advisors that advise the president on key issues uh, that are happening in the United States or globally and then lastly president serving two terms uh, every president from Washington up till up to FDR will serve no more than two terms FDR will be elected to a third and fourth term after he passes away Congress will pass the 22nd Amendment that places a presidential term limit to just two terms. Uh, so these are the three precedents that Washington left behind for future presidents. So what I want you to do with, with questions 2 through 15, I want you to read these excerpts that go with them and answer these questions. Uh, once you don't finish that, please make sure you work on your vocab. That is going to be due tomorrow night at 1159. If you have any questions, please reach out to me so I can help you.